so welcome, Jamie Webb, the Chief of the Environmental Education and Training Unit at the UNEP, the United Nations um, Environmental Program. So thank you. Um, let's start talking a little bit about the UNEP itself. So um, in accordance with the recommendation of uh, the outcome of the Rio Plus 20 UN Conference on Sustainable Development um, that was called the, the Future We Want. Um, the General Assembly decided that the UNEP should be strengthened and upgraded. Um, what are the progress that has been done since then, I mean, the last five years? Um, thank you for the question. Since Rio Plus 20, actually, as we did before, uh, UN Environment continues to work under the direction of our member countries. But what we've seen since Rio Plus 20 is that the scale of political engagement in addressing environmental issues is, has increased. Uh, since Rio Plus 20, the UN Environment Assembly became the highest level UN body ever on the environment, uh, and it's adopted resolutions on everything ranging from environmental education to, to dust and sandstorms. Uh, backstopping implementation of these uh, decisions, UN Environment's highly qualified staff have been working with partners and countries uh, to address what have emerged as some of the greatest environmental challenges of our time. Some of the things that we've started to get into um, include things like using space-based technology to manage natural resources more effectively um, and you know, adopting global programs to promote sustainable lifestyles. So overall, the diversity of issues that UN Environment addresses continues to grow since Rio Plus 20, and they continue to grow with a political backing um, that is in excess of what we had seen before the meeting. Right, um, and the, the medium-term strategy of, uh, of the UNEP, uh, which is 2014-2017, is oriented toward um, a business model that is based on partnerships um, as an opportunity to expand the reach and the impact further than what the UNEP could be um, just working uh, on its own. So um, what uh, measurable results um, have, you, have you done in this, you know, in this, um, from this standpoint? Uh, yeah, UN Environment has always and will continue to work in partnerships with others. Uh, in fact, if anything, our engagement in partnerships will be scaled up under our new strategy. Uh, to give you one example, in my own division, we lead a global universities partnership on environment and sustainability. Uh, this network has over 800 members around the world, most of them located in the global south. And together as a network, we work to empower universities of, as agents of transformative change in our sustainable development world. Some of the activities that are covered under this partnership include environmental education, whether that be curricula development or the offering of new courses, new master's programs. We also support needs-based research and innovation that links the technical expertise that we have in universities to the governments that are trying to address the sustainable development goals. Um, we also support community engagement. This is where we really encourage universities to get out within their own communities to identify and solve some issues around sustainable development. And we look to profile sustainable lifestyles on campus so that students, when they're at university, just get to see what a sustainable lifestyle is and how the choices they can make can affect sustainability. Uh, we also, within our unit, work in partnership with other UN agencies. We're members of the UN Alliance on Climate Change Education, Training, and Public Awareness. This alliance was actually set up under the UN Climate Change Convention um, in order to support countries in building the knowledge base and internal capacity to respond to climate change. So within this partnership, along with 12 other UN members, we've committed to strengthening climate change education, um, which is now recognized as a critical element of the achievement of the Paris Climate Agreement. Moving forward, we're looking to significantly step up our engagement with the private sector. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, institutional investors are estimated to hold as much as $85 trillion in financial assets, which could be mobilized to support green investments. Um, corporations themselves manage an estimated 5% of the world's freshwater resources. So it's critical to partner with 
uh, the private sector whenever we're looking at doing work on um, freshwater management or water and air pollution. And finally, if we look just since the year 2000, companies have acquired land rights that cover an area almost seven times the size of Sri Lanka, uh, which makes companies and pri the private sector a significant consumer of natural resource assets. So moving forward, um, we recognize that partnerships are key to achieve, achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, we need to affect sustained long-term change amongst our partners um, and in partnership with them on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Lots of things <laughs> boiling <laughs> in, in, in the pot. Um, yes. So um, and I think it's also important that we, uh, with regards to private business, that they figure out, I mean, they understand that this climate change is, is also an opportunity and not like um, the, uh, only a way to, you know, trying to s stick to their um, traditional way of doing business without, you know, ignoring the, 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 chal the, the challenges, but also the opportunities that they can bring on, on the table. Exactly. And I think that that's something that we, uh, both us and the private sector recognize that and there's a benefit from partnership. If you look, for example, at the New York Declaration on Forests, where the private sector, a number of companies in the private sector committed to deforestation free supply chains, um, that's a fantastic commitment. But in order to actually meet that commitment, the private sector has turned to the UN system to say, please provide us with, with support and an understanding of supply chain and deforestation risks and drivers so that we can actually meet our obligations. So there's a number of examples of, of great. Uh, cooperation with the private sector. And uh, with regards to the situation worldwide, like um, how is the state of the art of the sustainability? Um, so which countries are doing the most on, you know, what geographical areas and what maybe also in what areas are they, um, you know, stepping forward? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer because every country in the world agreed to the Sustainable Development Goals, which in my opinion represents the state of the art in terms of environmental sustainability. So it's a bit difficult to single out one or two. Um, from our own work on environmental education, we can draw good practices from around the globe. Here in Africa, for example, Kenya and Morocco have both launched national green university networks which makes them amongst the most active leaders in environmental education. They've mobilized universities from across the countries in order to unite to increase the impact that environmental education can have on the country's achievements of the sustainable development goals. But if you look at the National Green University Networks, one of the priorities amongst these networks is to learn from other experiences. Uh, we have a great Great example from Latin America, where they carried out national assessments based on university sustainability indicators. And there's now a call from Kenya and Morocco to learn from this Latin America experience so that it can be applied in their own countries. So while they have the framework in place for National Green University Network, they're drawing on good practices from other regions in the world. Uh, we also see governments playing an increasing role in environmental education and, and can draw some good practices from that. Uh, in China, environmental education is a key component of their national air pollution abatement strategy. And universities such as Tongji University and Tsinghao are already partnering with UN Environment to ensure that future professionals in China have the green skills they need to respond to environmental challenges. So that's another example of, of a very active and, and, uh, and high achieving country. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it isn't hard to find successes across the globe, but that's why we're working so hard to bring universities together to share their experiences, because we recognize the fact that there's different examples of successful activities scattered around the globe, and that if we bring universities together as a productive network in support of environmental sustainability, these examples can be scaled up and the level of expectation around the globe can be increased. So as um, when we talk about education, right, who do you think uh, you need to target in order to achieve the best results? Like younger, old generation experts or like regular citizens? I mean, when we're talking about universities, of course, um, you, we're talking probably about like normal um, young people. 
um, when I say normal, I say like regular citizens, right? Uh, so, um, is it what's the best, you know, the best way to go through, for example, as a um, in terms of education? Yeah, um, here at UN Environment, we largely target two groups: uh, university students as well as the uh, as well as professionals and policymakers. So we have more of a technical focus. Uh, however, we work in close partnership with organizations such as UNESCO, who take the lead on education for sustainable development in primary and secondary schools. And what we've seen is you really need the whole life education in order to have an impact. Uh, but we've also seen that that's a very difficult challenge to meet. Uh, with regards to universities, we don't limit our interventions only to students studying environmental science or biology or conservation science. Rather, we've noticed that if we're to actually make any solid achievements in the sustainable development goals, we need to engage people from all walks of life. Uh, in the US, for example, eight out of 10 university graduates end up working in the private sector. If throughout their university career, we can introduce them to some of the, sustain the principles of sustainability and help them to understand how they can apply those principles as they go on to their professional life. Then instead of being a in a situation in which we're constantly having to make the business case for environmental sustainability, we'll be talking to a sustainability literate generation of professionals who already understand the importance and can develop their own innovative ways to apply by sustainability. So that's one of the reasons that we really target universities. Um, and we're not alone in that. If you look at uh, software companies, they provide a lot of their software free to university students. And they do that because they've seen that if you train students to prefer a certain platform, chances are they'll choose that platform over the course of their lives. We want to do the same thing in sustainability. We want to train students to make sustainable lifestyle choices while they're at university in the hopes that the habits that they'll build at university will continue through their lives. So that's why we have a very strong focus on university and why we think that it's important to engage university students in environmental education. Mm -hmm. But we also recognize that the world is changing quite rapidly and there's a need for constant skills development. And that's why we offer uh, a lot of online courses and capacity development to policymakers that may have been working in the field for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, but need an upgrade in their skills to understand the latest technologies, the latest innovations, um, the most recent understanding of the links between what are very, very complex issues that we need to address if we're to achieve sustainable development. And um, with regards to the WAKE, the World Environmental Education Congress Network, uh, what advice would you have, like uh, what we could do, in, it could do in, um, in order to grow stronger and more effective and in terms of participation, uh, best practices? Because uh, we all talk about um, education, right? So. Um. Yeah, I actually, the, I think the timing is perfect to ask this question. Uh, the latest meeting of the UN Environment Assembly adopted a resolution on environmental education. Uh, environmental education also features on the agendas of the regional environment minister forums in both Africa and Latin America this year. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have Sustainable Development Goal Target 4.7, which calls for access to education for sustainable development for all. So together, these signs point to a reinvigoration of environmental education as a high priority for governments. My advice then to, to the WEEK network is to consolidate and, and mobilize your expertise to identify and respond to some of these government needs as they arise. Uh, as a network, you have a great deal of expertise available. But you need to target this expertise. Look at those countries that are engaging in environmental education planning processes, such as Kenya and Argentina and make sure that weak members are aware of the debates um, and are engaged as important stakeholders. So overall, I would suggest that the network focuses attention on connecting with governments and offering support to an education for sustainable development within the framework of the sustainable development goals. That means identifying what exactly it is that the network offers towards the achievement of target 4.7, um, looking at how you can make network members more accessible to government counterparts and ensuring that you're following 
keeping the global debates and keeping abreast of the latest and greatest in terms of education decisions on, on the environment and sustainable development. Thank you very much. Um, and maybe the last thing, because we have a, um, a very strict you know, relationship in our as a WEC, we say culture and environment, oh, we put them very, very in a strong relationship. Um, so what are your thoughts on this, um, on this relationship? I guess uh, it would come to my mind like ideas like it the indigenous culture, the multiculturalism, but also the one that you were mentioning earlier, like um, the, the general uh, green culture and like even an urban green culture mm -hmm. that we can create in, in the young people and in, in, the, in, in people in general. So um, how would you comment uh, this culture and environment uh, relationship? Yeah. Um, I, I came to this post from the Convention on Biodiversity, which has a very strong focus on the role of culture and environmental decision making. And when I began my work as the head of the Environmental Education and Training Unit, I noticed one significant weakness in our program. And that's the fact that we're not effectively engaging with Indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, specifically, the education material that UN Environment is producing is not fully taking on board traditional and Indigenous this knowledge, nor are we presenting information in a way that respects traditional teaching and learning methods. And I strongly believe that this is negatively affecting the quality of the work that we're able to do. Um, for, for me, the relationship between culture and environment means that as the SDG state, no one is left behind. I think we need to adopt that mantra across the work we do on environmental education. And in the case of indigenous peoples and climate change education, um, in the case of culture and environment, this means better understanding how traditional knowledge, innovations and practices can make our education products better. Of course, taking into consideration the need to obtain the free prior and informed consent of the holders of such knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, it also means recognizing that, stand, that the standard approach we've taken to lectures and lists of facts and figures are not appropriate teaching methods if we wish to respect culture and the link between culture and environment. And it also means acknowledging that if we continue with business as usual, we most certainly will be leaving many people behind um, by ignoring the connection between culture and environment and not designing environmental education systems that fully reflect the importance and the value of that connection. Yes, it's interesting because the education um you know, uh, issue takes care of, I mean, you also need, you need to include those, uh, those learning that, that knowledge, for example, of indigenous people, but you would also need to, uh, tailor your educational programs or your educational tools and means in order to reach everybody. So you, I think you need uh, to collect information from everybody, like their knowledge and also make it possible for everybody to receive your your information I mean your your knowledge no? yeah um, it's it's also important I think to look at how the knowledge is handled um, in the past there's been a tendency to uh, take traditional knowledge and put it in a standard database format where you have a title and uh, a one paragraph description of the knowledge and perhaps a link to something on the website. And that's not respectful of the, the nature of traditional knowledge or how it's transmitted. Uh, so we do need to improve the, our treatment of cultural knowledge on the environment to make sure that we're respecting this, the nature of that knowledge when we take it on board um, and when we disseminate it. Okay, thank you very, very much, Jamie. Um, and good luck with your work. <laughs> and uh, thanks for, for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. And I wish you the, the best of luck with the upcoming uh, week Congress in Vancouver. And I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, yeah, indeed. Thanks. Thanks.